Well, let's get into the topic of heart disease. And of course, that's the number one killer in the Western world. And uh, this is the discussion that I, I would like to have with you if uh, I was your doctor. But this is the kind of discussion that all doctors should have with their patients. You need to know some of the, the basic things, the basic uh, principles, and I'm gonna share them with you. And I'm also gonna share a lot, a lot of scientific information, but that's for you to, to delve into later. You know, I'll show slides that uh, show many of the studies and you might say you might be professionally interested or for whatever reason, it may be important enough for you to go and look up the basic research. So I've provided it for you just you know, hit stop, pause on your on your playback of uh, this video, and you can see the research. You can easily go to Google or the National Library of Medicine. You can read the papers that I've read, and you can find out that I have not exaggerated and I've told you the truth. So even though I have a lot of information to share with you, and there will be even more information if you take advantage of the slides that I put together, and not just over the last two weeks. This has been going on for decades. Uh, then I think you'll have uh, the information that you need to protect yourself and your family and your friends from unnecessary treatments and you'll be able to help them get well. Uh, the classic symptom of heart disease is chest pain, but there are many things that cause chest pain. It could be come, from, come from your esophagus and often people have indigestion or GERD and they worry they have a heart attack, but of course that's not the case, even though indigestion and GERD are dietary diseases, obviously what you put in your esophagus is what determines whether it feels good or feels poorly. Uh, you can get chest pain from the uh, costochondral cartilage, which is, which is a, a part of the rib cage. And it can be easily inflamed. We call that uh, costochondritis. The, the membranes around the heart can get inflamed and you can get pain from that. That's called pericarditis. A heart attack is what you fear. And a heart attack is usually uh, usually experienced as uh, pain in the front of the chest and maybe on the left side a little bit towards the center. And uh, sometimes the pain travels up, uh, up to the jaw on the left side and in the, into the left arm. And it is, uh, it is a pain that you've never experienced before, usually. And it lasts uh, for hours. You know, people describe it as if an elephant sat on my chest but it's not always that way. About 12% of people don't have any chest pain at all. No, they don't have any signs or symptoms of, of having a heart attack. So sometimes it's a silent disease. And then uh, there's the problem of angina, which is not a heart attack. It's a matter of having uh, insufficient blood flow to the heart muscle. And the heart muscle hurts when it doesn't get enough blood. Now, the nice thing about angina is it goes away when you rest. Usually it only lasts a few minutes. So we have some very effective anti-anginal medications out there. So let's, uh, you know, if you have chest pain, you might think about uh, whether it's a heart attack or not. I, one thing I do wanna tell you, and I'm gonna tell you several times through this presentation, if you have sudden onset of severe chest pain, you need to get to the hospital. Because if the, the cardiac team can treat you within 90 minutes of the onset of chest pain, or, or certainly within six hours, then they can make a difference. They can preserve heart muscle and maybe save your life. So even though I'm gonna give you a message about how intervention by the medical profession doesn't work, there are circumstances where it does work and that's in an acute emergency situation where you have sudden onset of chest pain. And if you have the fortune of getting into the laboratory, into the, uh, the theater where they perform this procedure, uh, Doctors can make a difference. They can dissolve the blood clot that has recently formed and you know, maybe save your life, certainly save some heart tissue. Uh, if you, uh, the best way to find out whether or not you have uh, a tendency towards heart trouble and what your likelihood of having a heart attack or stroke or other artery problems is, well, I mean, the most definitive way would be uh, to, to discover it at autopsy, or, but that's, that's pretty drastic. Uh, you uh, might also undergo a, a procedure such as a, an angiogram. That, that's pretty drastic too. But you can get a good indication of what your chances of having closures or closures of your arteries by just taking a simple blood test that is, you know, costs a few dollars, five, ten dollars, and doesn't cause any any harm to you other than a, a prick in where they insert the needle and 
you, you get a value a cholesterol level. And so based on your cholesterol level, whether or not you have significant lesions, and those would be lesions, uh, closures of 50% or greater, we call that significant. For This is for a, a man under the age of 40. And uh, the chance of having a significant lesion, let me just give you a few figures. If your cholesterol is under 200, you have a 20% chance of finding lesions on an angiogram. If your cholesterol is, say 250, you have nearly a 50% chance of finding lesions when they do an autopsy or an angiogram. Now, my high cholesterol was uh, 338 milligrams per deciliter. And at just knowing that, you know, I discovered it when I was in my early 20s that my cholesterol was that high. Uh, you, you, I would have known if I had this chart that I had over a 90% chance of having significant artery closure, significant ath atherosclerosis. Well, many of you know my history. I had a massive stroke at age 18 and uh, my blood cholesterol predicted that I was going to have that kind of problem. Or you can also tell whether or not you have disease based on your age. Uh, based on your age, uh, uh, the chance of having uh, significant lesions that are described as moderate or severe increases as you get older. Why? Because you've eaten the Western diet for more years. You know, you've, uh, you put more cholesterol and fat into your artery system. You've done that by eating animal foods and also other junk doesn't help either. So if you're uh, 28 years old, you've got a 22% chance of finding significant blockages. If you're my age, which is uh, almost 75, you have a 90% chance of having these problems. And that's of course, people who are eating the Western diet. You know, we're not talking about people who have eaten a healthy diet. Now, even though my cholesterol was at a top of 338 milligrams per deciliter when I was in my early 20s. You know, I've had my cholesterol checked uh, more than a dozen times over the last uh, 15 years. And my cholesterol runs between 100 137 to 151 milligrams per deciliter. So you could change all that. And even though I had a stroke at 18 and you know, anybody would have predicted that I'd had, I would have had uh, <clears throat> heart surgery and maybe be dead by my early thirties, I'm still functioning. I'm still doing well. I don't have a, I don't have a bit of chest pain. So I have to assume that my arteries are in darn good shape, at least as far as having a risk of having a serious problem. Uh, atherosclerosis is a disease due to an uncontrolled fork and spoon that keeps shoveling unhealthy components of your food into your body and your body is malnourished. And as a result, the arteries get diseased. Uh, you have <clears throat> globs of fat uh, that are incorporated under the thin wall of the artery. You have the slivers of cholesterol that get in under the artery wall and they cause inflammation. Kind of, kind of like if you stuck a sliver of wood under your skin, uh, you would have inflammation from that sliver of wood in, in your hands, say. And uh, what you'd see is you'd see swelling and redness and soon what would happen if you left that sliver in your hand is you would develop a pustule. And eventually what would happen if you didn't take the sliver out and you would because you have nerves in your hand, you would uh, develop a scar tissue that would cover up that sliver of wood. So that's the natural process of healing. Now, in this case, we have a system that has no arteries, or excuse me, no nerves. So you can feel nothing. This is a silent disease because the arteries are, are, are not accompanied by a nervous system that tells you that there's a problem. And so you have this disease going on unbeknownst to you. And you get the, uh, the swelling and the redness. And if you had nerves, you'd feel the pain and, and you could measure the heat. You can actually measure the heat of the, uh, of the uh, progression of atherosclerotic lesions. So at the same time that disease progresses, uh, the body is healing itself. The problem is, is that <clears throat> the damage from the fork and spoon outpaces the ability of the body to heal itself. Your, your body never stops trying to heal. So what you have to do is just stop the damage and uh, then you get the results that you're looking for. You can uh, take a look at the arteries in a relatively safe way, relatively inexpensive with, with x-rays. We have x-rays tied to computers that do heart scans and we even put contrast material now and do heart scans that, that, that show pictures of the heart arteries as good as an angiogram would do. 
And one of the things you see when you do these uh, heart scans is you see calcification of the arteries. And calcification represents old, old lesions. Y you may have noticed this in some other areas of inflammation of your body. Maybe you weren't aware of it, but for example, you probably heard about bursitis and tendonitis. That's where the bursts and the tendons, say in the arm, are chronically inflamed. And if it's been going on for a long time, you take x-rays, you see calcification of the tendons and the bursts. Uh, the classic sign of tuberculosis, which is due to a bacterium that affects the lungs, is a, a miliary calcification. You know, in other words, you have calcification all over the lungs. And it's from chronic inflammation due to this, uh, this bacterium that infects the lungs. And one other case that you may recognize as far as old, chronic, scarred, calcified lesions is if you get a mammogram. What's often reported is that you have calcification of your milk ducts. Well, this just represents long-term years and decades of inflammation of your milk ducts in your breast. And, and finally, finally, calcium and scar tissue is laid down. The thing that I want you to understand from this is when you see calcium on a heart scan, it just re represents old disease. And I know if you get a heart scan, you're gonna be terribly worried about it, but they, those are old scars. And if you change your evil ways, the old scars will probably stay there, but you won't have any further progression. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> time-honored classic way of uh, showing whether or not the arteries are plugged by blockages is to do an angiogram. And that's where they stick a catheter, it's usually in the leg, sometimes in the arm. And here's the catheter here, and it's fed up into the root of the aorta. And the dye is blown into the arteries. And what you see is you see shadows that are, are right here. They're, they're, the arrow points to a shadow. And the, these are old fibrous non-lethal plaques that have been there for, for decades. But that's what, worries the patient and what the doctor uses as an excuse for why you should have heart surgery. You know, we're, we're taught in medical school how to sell this procedure. Let me give you a, a, a typical scenario that occurs is uh, we'll pick a man having a heart attack. And what happens is the doctor comes into the patient's room and his wife is there. And he says to the wife, uh, come on over here. I, I want to show you something. And he puts up this particular x-ray and uh, the wife looks at it and she he says to her, you know, uh, you know what we call this lesion here? You know what the, we, we call this right here? What, what do we call this lesion? You, you folks know. We call it a widow maker. How can you resist operating on a widow maker? You know, the wife leaves and the doctor comes in and visits the patient and the doctor may carry on a conversation such as, you know, I met your wife and I got a chance to meet your, your children and you want, you want to stay alive long enough to see them graduate and marry and start their own families and have grandkids, don't you? Well, I want you to know you're not going to leave the hospital. You're not going to see sunshine unless you submit yourself to this procedure. A procedure that treats old scars. And we're going to talk about this. You're going to understand this in detail. It's important that you understand what I'm trying to share with you, that what the doctors are looking at, what they can see, and what they treat are old, fibrous, sometimes calcified, non-lethal, in other words, they don't kill, scars. Uh, before we get into the discussion, I want you to know that this goes on in the entire body. You have over 60,000 miles of blood vessels in your body. And these blood vessels are effective and they close down in various areas of the body. And we name the disease based upon which arteries close down. For example, if the arteries in the eyes close down, we call that macular degeneration, which is the most common cause of blindness in the general population. Uh, what I want you to understand is that this is a disease of all the arteries throughout the body, not just the heart. And uh, we have over 60,000 miles of arteries and blood vessels in the body. 
And we name the disease based upon the arteries that are closed, what organ is affected. For example, if you uh, close the, the blood vessel system, the arteries to the eye, the most uh, sensitive seen part of the eye is the macula and you get macular degeneration. Macular degeneration is the most common cause of blindness in adults in Western countries. If you close the arteries to the ears, you get hearing loss. Uh, you also get tinnitus and you get dizziness because there's one artery that goes to your inner ear. And if that's compromised, then you develop these kinds of problems. Uh, strokes, I mentioned to you that I had a stroke when I was 18 years old. That happens when you close the arteries to the brain, close the arteries to the heart and you have a heart attack. You close the arteries that feed large blood vessels and you have uh, aneurysms. Uh, John Ritter, the TV star, he had an aneurysm, of course, uh, he, had, he got national attention because of it. You uh, <clears throat> close the arteries to the kidneys and you have kidney failure, uh, to the bowel and you get a bowel infarct. Uh, if you close the arteries to the, to the spine, uh, you develop uh, degenerative disc disease. The, the spine is made up of bones and between the bones are, um, are discs, uh, they're cushions. And uh, they're supplied by various arteries that get their nutrients, their oxygen, and so on, through an indirect system. <clears throat> and if you uh, end up having a back pain, what this can be related to is the fact that you're having angina or low blood supply to the back. This is a common cause. We have autopsy studies that show this. To get degenerative disc disease, what happens is the blood supply of the spine gets compromised severely and the disc degenerate. I mean, if you go to the doctor with a ruptured disc and you ask doc, what, what caused my ruptured disc? The doctor says it was caused by degenerative disc disease. And you should be asking, hey doc, well, what made my disc degenerate? Well, what caused the disc to degenerate to the point where you, you took a step or made a turn? You didn't lift up a piano or a Volkswagen to do it. You just made a, a, a normal motion and the discs were so weak that they ruptured. And that's due to low blood supply to the spine. You close the arteries to the legs and you develop pain when you walk, it's called intermittent claudication. When the arteries to the legs close down very severely, you develop gangrene. Now here's something that will cause you to have attention to what I'm talking about. And that is you close the arteries to the penis and you become impotent. That's the most common cause of impotence. And uh, what happens is uh, the penis becomes erect because of the filling of a spongy material. And when you compromise the arteries, the spongy material doesn't fill, you don't get an erection. So that's how you develop uh, impotence. It's not lack of interest in, in, in other people. So there are all kinds of, uh, of different organs that get affected in the way that we're talking about. All right, now to, to begin this discussion, this is very important for you to understand. The reason it's important for many of you to understand is because you're gonna look for the easy way out. You're gonna look for a treatment that doesn't involve you to make a lot of effort. And of course, doctors have those kinds of treatments. You, wanna, you want something that's kind of Star Wars, modern technology. And so we need to look at the standard treatment of artery disease you need to know what the real results are of heart surgery. And that's where we're gonna focus our attention is heart surgery. So once, once I put this in perspective for you and you realize that you're not gonna be saved by the medical profession, then you'll start looking for other answers, which I'm gonna also give you as we go along in the slide presentation. Uh, the most common procedure done, and there are a million done a year, it's developed in 1977, is an angioplasty. And this is where a catheter is inserted usually in the groin, in the leg, and it's fed up into the heart. And uh, what, what they do, I'll show you in just a second, is they fix the, the, the blockages. Sometimes uh, this procedure is, uh, is performed through, through an artery in the arm, but usually it's the leg. So they feed this catheter up into the heart arteries and uh, into the area of blockage. And the catheter has a balloon on it and uh, they inflate the balloon and it breaks up the blockages. And this is good. I mean, you could relieve uh, chest pain by breaking up the blockages, 
But unfortunately, the process of breaking up the blockages releases products of injury that cause the blood to clot. And as a result, half the arteries so treated are completely closed down by subsequent blood clots within five months. And doctors realized this soon after they started doing the procedure. And the next phase of doing angioplasty was to add, add stents. In this case, bare metal stents, which prop the arteries open and help prevent the formation of blood clots. Now it's kind of like a Chinese finger puzzle that you expand. And once you expand these stents, uh, you can't take them out and you can't unexpand them. They're there permanently. Now, you know, that was a good idea, except for one thing, and that's the body does not like to have bare metal in it. And so what it does is it tries to cover up the bare metal and it does it by proliferation of the, the cells and the inside line of the artery, the enema. And as a result of this cell proliferation, it completely closes down the arteries in 40% of the cases within a year. And so doctors had to figure out how in the world they can stop this cell proliferation. Well, there's a whole, a whole segment of the, of the medical profession that deals with cell proliferation. And these are oncologists with cancer chemotherapy. And so they, they developed drugs that, uh, <clears throat> that they could impregnate into the bare metal stents that would slowly come out of the bare metal stents and keep the cells from proliferating. So these, these bare metal stents, and they're what are popular these days. In fact, 90, 95% of the procedures are done with bare metal stents. They are called drug eluding stents because the cancer chemotherapy, so to speak, agents slowly come out of the, uh, of the, uh, of the stent. And uh, as a result, it keeps uh, the cells from proliferating. You've got the stent there, which keeps the blood clots from forming. But it was soon discovered that, again, the body doesn't like bare metal in it. And there was a high rate of sudden death after placing these drug eluding stents. And so the answer to that was to add to the patient's uh, treatment drugs that uh, stopped the blood from clotting. These would be aspirin and drugs like Plavix. But the problem is, is the drug eluding stents are fully eluded. All the drug is gone after about four months. And so in that case, now you're dealing with a bare metal stent and you don't need to take these extra, what we call anti-platelet therapy drugs anymore. And these can be discontinued usually after four months after the stent is placed in the heart artery. Certainly by 12 months, they can be stopped. Well, let's take a look at the results of all this effort, all this technology, all this science. And let's take a look at the, the research that has been done to prove whether or not it works, whether or not we keep people alive, keep them from going for further heart surgery, keep them from having heart attacks. And one of the first studies done was the, the OAT trial and this is the occluded artery trial. It was done on nearly 2,200 stable patients who had had total occlusion um, three to 28 days after the heart attack, they had the procedure done. There were people with high risk of having another heart attack. And what did they find? They found that angioplasty, which is uh, percutaneous interventions, did not reduce the risk of occurrence of death or reinfarction or heart failure. This is really disappointing. And as a matter of fact, people who had the procedures done, the angioplasty procedures done, they ended up having an excess of uh, reinfarction, uh, in other words, further heart attacks uh, when they followed up for four years. This was disappointing to say the least. And then we had the COURAGE study, which was nearly 2,300 patients who had severe heart disease. and they divided them into two groups. And what they found is this intervention did not reduce the risk of death, heart attacks, or other major cardiovascular events. That was disappointing. And other studies were subsequently done. And you might ask yourself, well, you know, wh what about studying people longer and more severely ill people? If you take a look at all the studies done, and this was published in 2012, at that time, they had 12 randomized clinical trials involving 8,000 people. 
you're basically looking at all the data. What they found was that uh, intervention did not reduce the risk of mortality or cardiovascular death or non-fatal infarctions or the need for having further heart surgery done. Yeah, all the studies showed this when they looked at them together. Well, how, how about long-term? Maybe, maybe they didn't wait long enough uh, after the procedure. Well, here's uh, 15 years, study of 15 years, in other words, long-term survival. They, they found no benefit. And, and how, about, how about if you take a look at more severely occluded arteries, you know, ones that are totally occluded and you treat those arteries well, they did that and uh, they found out there was uh, no reduction in, in risk of dying. One, one of the, uh, the writings from the Annals of Internal Medicine that I really enjoy is uh, about this procedure, angioplasty, and it's titled uh, Money Fund and Angioplasty. And uh, they note that there's uh, no survival benefit from doing these procedures. And then they go on and say something that I think is really telling. We suggest that the combination of three factors never so closely associated before in the history of medicine has been a synergistic has been synergistic in promoting coronary angioplasty. It's very lucrative. Patients are mostly self-referred and it's fun. I and mean, this is done in an operating room theater and the technicians, the doctors, they go in there and they pass these catheters and the catheters have to be bent around some pretty severe curves. And, you know, as, as the procedure progresses, there's cheers from the crowd this is very ego enhancing. Well, the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association, uh, they looked at the data that I just showed you and uh, they were concerned to the point where in 2007, they told cardiologists to stop doing these procedures on people who have chronic coronary artery disease. And then they studied the impact of their recommendations. And this is one of the two studies. And the title of the study is The Impact of National Clinical Guideline Recommendations for Revascularization of Persistently Occluded Infarct-Related Arteries on the Clinical Practice of Medicine. In other words, the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association, they went to the trouble of looking at all the data and telling doctors to stop doing this. Uh, what was the response from the medical business? Well, the response was no change. No change. And in the article, and as they say, there are two articles that looked at this. In the article, they said, this is of concern. First, because patients continue to undergo costly and ineffective procedures. And they also said, it seems to be a waste of money to take and do these, these assessments and to turn around and make recommendations to our colleagues because they don't respond. In an editorial, they really put it in perspective. They said, personal financial gains are the reason for people doing procedures that result in no benefit. Well, there are risks to angioplasty, uh, sticking this catheter up into the coronary arteries and blowing them up and placing stents and placing drug eluting stents. Uh, the risk of death is uh, less than 1% serious complications, less than 5%, but that's in talented people. In bad hands, uh, the risk of complications can be as high as 18% and death can be as high as 2% of the patients. And I wanna tell you folks, there are a lot of bad hands out there. You know, you, you need to be very careful about picking your technician. But there is a place for angioplasty and I, I wanna make sure that I emphasize this enough. In, in the case of an emergency, if you have a sudden heart attack, and I told you this in the beginning, and I'm gonna tell you again, I'm gonna tell you one more time. If you have the sudden onset of a blood clot forming in your heart arteries, which causes, it's causing a heart attack, just causing heart muscle to die. If you can get to the hospital quickly and you can get to the laboratory quickly and they can insert the catheter and, and uh, put in the catheter blood clot dissolving mixtures, what happens is they can dissolve the clots and they can open up the arteries and they can save some muscle 
and maybe reduce the risk of dying and reduce the risk of having a weak muscle. But the, the assessment of this uh, emergency is that you have to have it done quickly. The sooner the better. But 90 minutes is usually the, the time limit given, but certainly it has to be done within six hours. After six hours, the heart, heart muscle is dead. The clot is, is, is fully organized. It's not gonna dissolve easily. What we've been talking about in the previous studies is people that are beyond six hours. People who have chronic coronary artery disease, which is most of the angioplasties that are done. Let's talk about open heart surgery, coronary artery bypass surgery, we call it the cabbage. And this is where they uh, cut a hole in your chest and expose your heart to stale operating room air. And they operate on various arteries that show blockage and they take grafts from usually the veins in the leg, but these days often from arteries in different parts of the body, like in the arm, and they, they use these to bypass uh, the lesions. The lesions, remember, are hard, fibrous, non-lethal plaques. And we'll look at the results of uh, three studies that have been done. There have only been three studies done that show whether or not this is beneficial to go through this procedure. And you'll also hear, even though the studies show no benefit, you'll see, you'll hear from doctors that, well, there is benefit in uh, treating one of the biggest blood vessels in the heart, which is the left main coronary artery. Well, that's not exactly true. Uh, if you look at the three studies done, and again, there are only three studies, what you show is there is essentially no benefit from doing the surgery in terms of staying alive. You have the veteran study, the European study, and the CAS study. At great financial cost, pain and suffering for the patient, and risk of complications and death. Now, if you want to take the trouble to look these studies up, I've cited them for you here and I give you the conclusions. The conclusions, conclusions are, is these procedures don't work on chronic coronary artery disease. And as far as the excuse that uh, the left main coronary artery, you know, that big trunk has to be bypassed because they call that the widow maker. Well, that's only if you have damage to the ventricle, or do you see benefits? In other words, it's highly questionable whether they save lives even for this, this big blockage. I leave it up to you to look at the studies. One of the more concerning complications uh, from uh, having coronary artery bypass surgery, uh, specifically when people are attached to the heart lung machine is embolization that occurs throughout the body. Uh, here's a picture of the retina of the eye. This is a place where you can see the blood vessels. The, the doctors peer into the eye and look at the back of the eye, and this is the fundus. And the first picture, what you see is the, uh, the vasculature before the surgery starts, before the patient is put on the heart-lung machine. And the arrows point to various, uh, various areas of the artery, and then the surgery is started. And you can actually put a stethoscope over the over the carotid arteries and you can hear the debris that is, uh, that is coming from the heart lung machine and embolizing throughout the body. In this case, you see where emboli have stuck in the blood vessels and caused blockage and what gets blocked dies. And so you have this diffuse embolization, you know, here they show the lesions uh, five days afterwards through a, a different kind of picture. Well, you know, the heart-lung machine is, is, a, is a medical miracle. I mean, when it's used in situations where you have no choice, you know, like uh, congenital heart disease, you know, children who have these defects, uh, you know, then it is a plain and simple miracle, even though there are significant risks. But what if you use it in people who have no advantage in terms of survival? And I just showed you the three major studies. There's no advantage in terms of survival from doing this procedure. Then you have only the complications that count. Now, what happens is the, the way you get this diffuse embolization is the blood is taken from one part of the heart and it's put through this machine which is a pump, which has membranes that put oxygen back into the blood and take carbon dioxide and other waste 
out of the blood system. And then what happens is the blood is dumped back into the patient. Well, in the process of going through the pump, what happens is bubbles are introduced into the circulation, some of them toxic gases. The blood cells are treated roughly and as a result, they form clumps. Little plastic parts break out of the membranes and break off the tubing and they are dumped back into the patient. You have this diffuse embolization throughout the body. Now, when you embolize a artery or arterial, what happens when it lies distal dies. Now, a lot of tissues can regenerate like your liver and your skeletal muscle, but your brain can't. You know, once it's died, the tissue is dead. There are also major strokes that occur as a consequence of being going through this surgery, but what we're talking about is, is not a stroke. We're talking about something that happens. How often does it happen? Well, essentially in 100% of patients. How often is it of significance? Well, uh, this uh, particular study, what they did is they did um, MRIs of the brain right after the surgery, and they found 51% of people, you could see the damage through a relatively crude technique technology. And then in another study, they looked at people five years after they'd had open heart surgery and had been on the heart lung machine, and they found a 20% decline in their mental function in 42% of the patients. Let's talk about some uh, unfortunate circumstances, and that is that people die as a consequence of undergoing this surgery. Remember a surgery that does not, does not prolong life based on the three major studies. And I give as the most tragic example, Neil Armstrong, the first man on the moon, heart surgeons killed him. Neil Armstrong went for a routine examination, no chest pain, no symptoms. And part of that routine examination just after his 82nd birthday is he got on a treadmill and he flunked the treadmill. And uh, as a result, they declared that he needed to have open heart surgery. Well, first of all, he didn't have the indications for having open heart surgery. He had no symptoms, no chest pain. That's one indication. The other indication would be theoretically to save your life. And as I showed you, the studies don't say that you're don't show that you're gonna live longer undergoing these procedures. Studies of thousands of people, all the studies done. Well, the treadmill is a conveyor belt to the operating room. And so it was with Neil Armstrong. And they didn't stop to think that uh, when you're 80 years old, you have a very high risk of dying during this procedure. So the first man on the moon, he took one giant leap for mankind but unfortunately he was sent to the world beyond by heart surgeons aggressively trying to do good. So uh, why does heart surgery fail? I I'm talking about angioplasty and this is a review and, uh, and coronary artery bypass surgery where they put in the grafts. Why does, it why does it fail? It fails because what they're treating is non-lethal scars which never kill. These are hard fibrous plaques. These represent the disease that has occurred decades before. The disease that kills are fresh, volatile plaques that rupture. Now they're tiny, these volatile plaques that rupture. The hard fibrous plaques are easy to see by our technology and they're easy to treat by angioplasty or by bypassing these blockages but the tiny pustules are hard to see and we have no treatments for them other than diet. The motivation is money, folks. The motivation is money, the patient be damned. Money, <laughs> let's talk about money. Uh, I used to work at uh, St. Lita Hospital, which at that time was the second uh, best cardiac surgery unit in the whole state of California. That's what the reputation was. 80% of their income came from heart disease and so does the income from your community hospitals, your major universities that perform cardiac surgery. 80% of their income comes from heart disease. 
and heart disease pays, the treatment pays. Open heart surgery can cost as much as $200,000 and angioplasty on average is $30,000. Now, if you wanna have a good review of what I just talked to you about, uh, go to the internet and look up a, a, a documentary that was done called The Widowmaker. And in this documentary, they talk to people on both sides of the table, the surgeons that uh, perform the procedures and also angioplasty we're talking about, and also those who are uh, critical of the procedure. And pretty much everybody agrees. These procedures do not save lives. And that's, that's the experts telling you this. Now, what they fail to tell you in The Widowmaker, this documentary, is they fail to tell you about the cure and the cure is changing your diet. But if you wanna see whether or not I'm exaggerating, when I tell you that heart surgery doesn't save lives because they're treating old, hard, fibrous, non-lethal plaques, watch this documentary. So, <clears throat> You must hear the truth. Uh, diet does stop chest pain and cures the arteries. Now, after you, you find out you're not gonna be saved by the medical business, you get real desperate and you go to the last corner in town, which is uh, what we teach. That is that you have to take responsibility for yourself. You have to change your diet. And the diet that uh, cures heart disease and improves circulation is a low fat starch based diet. A low fat diet stops closure of the arteries by healing the disease and stabilizes the volatile plaques, the ones that rupture and form clots. So if you take a look at, uh, at arteries, uh, as time goes on, and that's what you see here on the left-hand side, uh, they can become progressively closed. But part of this artery closure involves pustules, pustules that can rupture. They rupture like a pimple rupturing on a teenager's face. And the rupturing releases products of injury which cause the blood to clot. Here we have uh, another representation of the progression. You start out with a healthy artery, which has a one cell layer that separates the blood from the tissues. It's called the intima. And this gets damaged by an uncontrolled fork and spoon that shovels globs of fat and slivers the cholesterol into the artery walls. And as a result of this damage, you get inflammation, swelling, heat, pain if there are, if there are nerves to the arteries. And uh, eventually what happens is a pustule material forms in this area. Well, some of these pustules, little pimples on the inside of your artery, uh, they develop a thin cap. And as a result, they rupture. And it's the process of rupturing that releases products of injury that cause a blood clot to form. And it's the blood clot that finishes your system off, that kills the tissues. That's why, that's why heart attacks are sudden. You know, you're well one minute and the next minute you're having severe chest pain and you're dying or dead. It's because of the sudden formation of a blood clot secondary to the rupture of a volatile pimple. And these are present throughout your artery system. I wrote about this in a book I published in 1996. I showed you the illustrations. What happens is you have a small, very tiny pustule and it develops a little crack, which we call a fissure. And then the plaque ruptures and the inner contents of semi-liquid necrotic material comes spurting out in the bloodstream like a pimple rupturing on a teenager's face. And this act of rupture causes the blood to clot and the tissue that lies distal dies. Here, let's, let's take a look at it in some, with some motion. You have the development of, a, of, of plaque and some of this hard fibrous material, other is, uh, is the, the pustular material. And eventually what happens is, uh, and the person feels perfectly well, there are no symptoms at all. What happens is one of these pimples pops and the circulation is stopped by a blood clot, by small, largely unseen, by angiograms or CT scans. You know, doctors, if they could, if they could find and treat these tiny pustules, which are the lethal lesions, they would. 
but right now they can't, and I doubt that they ever will. Right now, what they can find is old fibrous non-lethal scars, and that's where the business is directed to. Okay, a low-fat diet stops chest pain. Now, one of the reasons to have heart surgery, because it doesn't save lives, is incapacitating chest pain. Well, you know, we have drugs uh, that uh, help with the chest pain, like beta blockers and calcium channel blockers and nitroglycerin. That's a classic drug used with people who have angina. But the, uh, the most effective way of treating chest pain is rarely if ever utilized. When I say rarely, it's utilized in my practice, but otherwise it's not. Uh, what happens is what you eat causes your blood to become compromised. What it does is when you eat a fatty meal, it causes the blood cells to stick together. You see blood cells, they naturally repel each other. They, they have negatively charged uh, membranes so that when they hit, they bounce off each other. And as a result, you have easy flow, good flow. But when you eat a high fat meal, I'm talking about vegetable fat or animal fat, what happens is the cells get coated with the fat and they no longer repel each other. They stick together. And you can see this, you can see the compromise in circulation by checking the oxygen. And the oxygen in the blood after a single high fat meal drops by 20%, which of course would bring on chest pain. By reducing the oxygen that goes to your heart. And by reducing the circulation that goes to your heart. Uh, let's take a look at this. Uh, this is a uh, a dramatic representation, it happens to be done in animal tissues, and it was done by my friend, my friend Roy Swank. And you see the, the rapid flow of blood prior to any high fat meal. And uh, then they feed fat, in this case, to uh, an animal. And the fat coats the cells, and see how they stick together. And the circulation slows, we call this rouleau formation. And it happens throughout the body, in the, in the heart arteries, in the brain arteries, and all over the body it happens. And uh, finally, after about, uh, about 10 hours, finally the, the circulation breaks up and you start to get flow again. But uh, you know, in the meantime, for that period of time after you eat, until the, until the system gets its circulation back, you're compromised. Uh, this was also done in people. It was studied by, by many researchers in, in, in live subjects and people, this, in this case, it's a 44 year old fireman. And the way they looked at the circulation is they looked at the whites of the eyes, which is called the conjunctiva. And they looked at it through a microscope and you see the picture on the left-hand side, you see really good circulation and uh, good blood flow, lots of, lots of blood vessels. And then what they did is they fed this 44 year old fireman one meal they contain 67% of the calories as fat. Well, let's look at the meal. He had two eggs, four strips of bacon, cream, bread, two pats of butter. I mean, how many of you eaten that meal? I certainly did in my youth. Well, after this one meal, they took another picture of the same area of the eye and you see a dramatic reduction in circulation. And as I told you, you can measure a 20% reduction in oxygen content of the blood, secondary to one high fat meal. And ladies and gentlemen, vegetable fat causes more severe and prolonged sludging than does animal fat. Now, you wanna look at the research done? Well, here it is. Multiple studies done in the 50s and 60s and one of them in the 70s show what I just told you. Well, why don't you hear about these studies today? Why don't you hear about feeding a low-fat diet to stop angina today? How are you going to make the money? Where's the profit? You can look these studies up. You can see what I'm telling you is the truth, and it's been documented by many researchers, but it's never used, except in my practice, to treat people with compromised arteries. The last study uh, published on... Uh, treating people who have angina was done by my friend, Dr. Dean Ornish. And he published this in 1983. And he took a group of people and he put them in a setting where he could feed them a low fat diet 
uh, like the diet that I encourage you to eat. And in 24 days, they had a 91% reduction in frequency of chest pain episodes. Why aren't they doing these studies over and over again? Show me the money. All right, how about the underlying disease? Can you stop the underlying disease? You may ask yourself, can you, can you reverse atherosclerosis? Well, yes, you can, but not the scars. I mean, the scars stay, but they're old scars. It's like when you fell off your bicycle and you landed on your forehead, you, you got a, a, a laceration and eventually it healed as a scar. And next time you fell on your forehead, where did it break? Not in the area of the scar, but someplace else. Scars are solid and they don't cause any problem unless they significantly block the, the arteries, which they do on rare occasions. But there's a whole nother part of this blockage that can be reversed. Uh, it, it's the, uh, the volatile plaques that are inflamed and the swelling that occurs. You can actually reverse the, the artery disease, but the way you have to do it is you have to stop the repetitive injury to the arteries. You see, the arteries are trying to heal. Your body never stops healing. You have this innate ability to heal. You know this, you, you know this because of other circumstances in your life. For example, if you get in an, in an accident, you fall off your bicycle, you get a laceration, you get a broken bone. You don't have to ask whether or not your bones and your skin are gonna heal. You know they're gonna heal. You know, in, in three weeks, the, the wounds are knitted together pretty good. The bones are knitted together enough for you to be walking around on crutches. Three months later, you're out there back on your bicycle. You didn't have to do anything special. You didn't have to take any medicine or say any chants or prayers. The body has an innate ability to heal. Of course, the, it can't catch up with the damage. That's the problem. You know, just like, for example, the cigarette smoker, they continue to have progressive cough and sputum and difficulty breathing until they stop the source of injury. And then what happens? They stop coughing. The lung function comes back. Oh, there may be some residual scar tissue there, but hopefully not for most of us. The uh, first evidence that you could heal this disease was performed by Walter Kempner at Duke University back in the 1940s. What he showed was that uh, you could reverse artery disease based on electrocardiogram. They didn't have angiograms. They didn't have uh, CAT scans back then. So they had to rely upon an, a technology which is called an electrocardiogram. Now, the sign of of, of compromised circulation to the heart is a segment of the electrocardiogram becomes depressed. This is called the ST segment. It follows the big spike. You see the depression there following the spike on the left-hand side of the EKG. And normal is when the ST segment is not depressed. Well, you know, Walter Kempner took his patients with coronary artery disease and he did electrocardiograms on them. And then he put them on the rice diet, which we're gonna talk about extensively in one of our future lectures, but it's a diet of rice, fruit, fruit juice, and table sugar. And what he showed is reversal of artery disease. Well, you can see the, the ST segments have become upright in this patient and most of his other patients based on electrocardiogram. Uh, Dean Ornish has done many studies, many studies. They don't not only show uh, lowering of cholesterol and triglycerides and getting rid of high blood pressure and solving your obesity problems and correcting insulin resistance and curing diabetes, but according to PET scans, 99% of patients stopped or reversed the progression of coronary artery disease. No, that's what Dean Ornish has shown. Uh, Caldwell Esselstyn, he did a different approach. Uh, he looked at uh, 200 patients with coronary artery disease and, and he showed by putting them on a diet that's almost exactly like the one that I teach and pretty close to the one that Dean Orange teaches. Documented by, by angiograms, you show reversal of the disease. Remember, it's not the scar part that reverses, it's, it's the, the, the part that is uh, still involved with swelling and inflammation that you can reverse and it's enough 
usually so that people stop having chest pain. And the most important thing is the sores, the postules, they stabilize and they heal by stopping the damage. Uh, here's one of my patients. Uh, he worked for the Attorney General of uh, the state of California and he discovered me just on the internet. And 61 years old, he had high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, recurrent kidney stones. We had 250 pounds and I had a cholesterol of 294. Well, that was okay. I mean, he was still living. But then he started to have what he thought was indigestion, went to his family doctor. The doctor said, you know, this, this, this chest pain you're having could be something else, could be more serious. It could be angina, which means that you have disease of your coronary arteries. So he was referred to a cardiologist. The cardiologist did a perfusion scan and the scan showed uh, mild to moderate perfusion defects along the inferior and lateral walls. Well, what do you think the cardiologist recommended? Of course, heart surgery. Well, you know, Robert's job in his entire life was working for the Surgeon General, suing physicians. That was his job. So he was suspect of what goes on in the medical business. And he, he decided he was gonna look into another way of dealing with his problems. And so this was January of 2008. Uh, in May of 2009, what we find is he has no angina. He's off all his medications for diabetes, high blood pressure, indigestion. He dropped his cholesterol 134 points and his bad cholesterol 150 points. He lost 60 pounds. 16 months later, he went to his general doctor and he said, you know, you have to have this confirmed by the cardiologist. And the cardiologist took one look at Robert and said, I don't believe it. You can't reverse this disease. I know this. I'm the expert. I'm the cardiologist. And so Robert agreed to get another perfusion scan. And so he did. And you see the results here, a reversal of the artery disease, healing of the arteries. And what did the cardiologist say? He said to Robert, they must have reversed the scans. Robert never went back. So there are reasons uh, to do heart surgery. The, the reason as stated to me as a medical student, still told to medical students today is for relief of incapacity and chest pain unrelieved by good medical therapy. Since these procedures don't save lives, and I've shown you this, I've shown you all the studies. There is another reason to have heart surgery is to relieve incapacitating chest pain by good medical therapy. Well, good medical therapy should be starting out with anti-anginal drugs like beta blockers and calcium channel blockers and nitroglycerin. You know, that, that's what the doctor should be prescribed. But by reflex, doctors send the patients for cardiac surgery. Okay. They, they fail another uh, criterion, and that's incapacity and chest pain. What's incapacity and chest pain? Say I got chest pain by walking my dog behind my house. That wouldn't be incapacitating because I really don't like walking the dog that much. I just stop walking the dog. Well, what if I got chest pain? And here's a picture of me on the North Shore of Maui. Well, going 34 miles an hour on my windsurfer. And I couldn't do that anymore. I might consider this incapacitating. What would I do? Well, I, I might get a uh, angioplasty done and, and maybe I'd get a bare metal stent done, but I don't think I'd get a drug eluding stent done. And I definitely quit windsurfing uh, if they only offered me open heart surgery with the associated brain damage. Now think about it in your life when you are threatened with uh, these kinds of aggressive treatments. Is it really incapacitating chest pain? Have they tried good medical therapy with you? No, they haven't. I assure you they haven't, even if they've pushed a few drugs on you, they haven't tried good medical therapy. <clears throat> I showed you that good medical therapy is improving the circulation by changing to a low fat diet. I've showed you the studies, you can look them up. So uh, how do you reverse this disease? Well, you reverse it by first identifying the cause. 
And people say this is a result of modern living. No, it's not, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, if you look at, uh, at autopsies of mummies uh, buried in their pyramids uh, three, 4,000 years ago, and they do autopsy on them, or these days they do CAT scans on their bodies. What you find is the extensive atherosclerosis in the kings and queens, the priests and priestesses. In, in fact, one major study, what they showed when they could identify artery parts is that half of them had evidence of atherosclerosis in their heart arteries, their leg arteries, and their brain arteries, and so on. The kings and queens and aristocrats, uh, they ate the rich food. There's even stories about how the priests would eat the offerings that were put on the statues. And sometimes they didn't even take the offerings home to their family before the ceremonies and eat them. All kinds of, uh, of diseases of eating rich food are, are present three, four thousand years ago. Now people didn't smoke then. They got lots of exercise and plenty of sunshine. The only thing that was different was the food that they ate. The people who built the pyramids lived on starch-based diets. And so it is with other times in history. You know the classic story of kings and queens, of aristocrats. They ate the rich food. You know, the, the starches were grown by the farm workers, the, the corn and the beans and the rice and the potatoes. And that was the diet of the, of the workers. Uh, but what uh, the aristocrats decided that they were going to do is they weren't going to eat this plant food directly. They were going to filter it through sheep and cows and pigs first, and then they'd eat those animals. And you know this, you know this, rich foods make people sick. They have then, they do now. The difference between then and now is that then there are only a few aristocrats. Uh, now half the population of planet Earth eats like kings and queens, Dairy Queen, Burger King, Imperial Margarine, they don't even disguise it. So by, by wealth, people end up eating the rich American diet, but also by necessity of environments. For example, the Inuit Eskimo. If uh, you take a look at autopsies done on Inuit Eskimos, in this particular case, what they're looking at is two women who were buried under an ice floe five centuries ago. One was estimated to be in her 20s, the other in her 40s. And uh, what they found was they found that they had extensive atherosclerosis and severe osteoporosis from their diet of fish and mammals, you know, whales and seals and so on. They didn't smoke. You know, they, they had lots of stresses in their lives but that wasn't the cause. The cause was the diet in uh, rich in animal foods. It's, it, it's been happening throughout history because that's not our diet. And as a result, we're malnourished and our body falls apart in so many different ways. Now, when you go about trying to solve your health problems, you might think, well, I'm gonna try something easy. I'm gonna try a low carb diet, you know, an Atkins-like diet, lots of meat and things that I really love. You don't really love these things. You can't eat them without covering them with salt and sauces. Well, there've been four major studies related to heart disease, looking at low carbohydrate diets and all, no other studies, there no, there, this is it folks, you can look them up. The four major studies show that eating these kinds of diets increases your risk of dying and dying of heart disease. So that's not how you want to approach the problem. The way you want to approach the problem is eating the diet designed for human beings, which is a starch-based diet. You know, like the, the people of Central America used to eat, the Incas and the Mayans, people of the corn, or the people of the Andes, the Incas who lived on potatoes and quinoa, or the people from the Middle East, Egypt, Iran, Iraq. That was known as the breadbasket of the world. They eat bread, wheat, and barley. Or when you think of the, 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 the places of Asia, what do you think about it? people, but Asians eating? Their diet's rice. Up until 1980, when they started watching CNN news and learned about the American way. And now, of course, people in China are 
developing obesity and diabetes at a similar rate to what we have in the United States. That's the diet that you need to eat, eat is uh, the diet for human beings, the ones that we've eaten through most of our existence of maybe 750,000 years we've been on this planet as, as Homo sapiens. You pick the time with it. You know, that's, that's been the diet of people. This, this, this modern Western diet is just a blip in history. It's, it's only been popular over the last 50 to 100 years, and it's killing us and the planet, much less the animals. Now, in addition to dietary change, uh, I also prescribe some medication. Uh, the medications are of some benefit in people who are really sick. Yeah, not, not in people who don't have symptoms of heart disease, not in people who haven't had a heart attack or a stroke or heart surgery. There's no benefit there, no reasonable benefit of taking statin drugs. It's only in people who have already, had, already declared themselves as being sick, have already been in trouble. Then there's a tiny benefit for primary prevention, which is in people who have no known disease, 98% of people saw no benefit. Whereas those who had already had a heart attack or heart surgery, in other words, this is secondary prevention, the results were statistically significant, yes. In this case, 96% showed no benefit and only 4% showed benefit. Not much, folks. These, these medications are oversold to you. They're not the answer to the problem because they're not the cause of the problem, but they're very profitable. Also aspirin, aspirin uh, helps, uh, helps the clot from forming. You know, it thins the blood. And so when a plaque ruptures, if you have aspirin on board, it's less likely to form a clot which closes off the artery, which kills the heart muscle and often the patient. But as you heard uh, October of 2021, the news, the headline news was that aspirin should not be used in the general population. Only in people who are severely ill does it show benefits. I, I was writing about this uh, back in 2010. I, I was telling you about the limits of, uh, of statin drugs in an article I wrote in 2013. This is old information, but it just doesn't get popular. Why? You know why? There's no profit. So my approach to heart disease is to heal the arteries, open the lumen, stop the chest pain, prevent a heart attack, get rid of the, the, the volatile rupture plaques, the pimples that line the arteries, and, and to keep you alive. And so to how do I approach my patients who have heart disease? Well, strict diet, and we teach this. We teach this now by a telemedicine, telehealth program that I encourage you to look into. And I give su sufficient statin medication to reduce the cholesterol to 150 milligrams per deciliter or less. And I'll give a baby aspirin, but only to people who have declared themselves as being ill. And maybe these medications do a little bit of good, but I, you know, I'm not gonna throw the baby out with the wash water. I'm a trained medical doctor. You know, I, I've learned these things about the benefits and risks of medications and treatments. And, you know, I'm gonna offer patients the advantage of what I learned through my traditional medical training as a board certified internist, who's taken care of over 12,000 patients over the last half a century. Yeah, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna deprive you of what I consider good medical care. If it works, it works. But I also know about the food. That's what I've studied for 44 years is the food. Diet therapy, it's caused. And I'm gonna prescribe this for you because that's where the benefit is. It's in fixing the cause. Uh, there are uh, several books uh, that I've written about heart disease and I encourage you to have these books. In fact, I encourage you so much to have these books that uh, I've made them available to you free. No gimmicks, you, you just go to our website. Uh, the two books uh, that are available to deal with heart disease are the McDougall Program for a Healthy Heart, free. And McDougall's Medicine of Challenge, your second opinion, free. Also, because I gave the talk on breast cancer recently, I, I also provided the book for you I wrote called The McDougall Program for Women Free. 
And I encourage you to download these files and share them with your friends and relatives and medical doctors. And you tell them this is a challenging second opinion. And if you have any disagreement with what Dr. McDougall says, you think he's out of date, you think there's better ways, there's, uh, there's research that I've missed, you tell them what my, what my email address is. I'll be glad to, to go over the scientific literature with them. Yeah, I wrote these, these books a while ago. Sure I did, but I keep up with the scientific literature and you know, I got it right the first time. I worked really hard to make sure that I understood what was going on and I cited properly the scientific research that supports it. In other words, folks, not only is the truth simple and easy to understand, the truth don't change. Thank you very much for listening to this presentation. I've certainly enjoyed giving it to you.